Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Rise up to pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for our Bible study tonight. We thank you because you always keep us alive and awake and interested in studying your word. We thank you tonight because we have come together again. Lord, we pray that tonight your spirit will speak to every heart, every family, every husband, every wife, and every brother, every sister in Jesus' name. Amen. Lord, we pray that with the coming of the word will be the coming of grace and strength and the power of the Spirit of God to carry out and to do what you have called us to do in your word. And Lord, we pray as you grant us the obedience to the word of God, the godliness and the grace and the strength and the power. We pray that the blessing that follows obedience, you grant to every one of us in Jesus' name. Amen. And we pray that you grant us concentration in our mind, concentration in the study, that our minds and hearts will not be wandering here and there, but will focus on the word of God tonight in Jesus' name. Amen. Teach us by your spirit. Lead us in the light of the word. Instruct us, Lord, by the illumination of the spirit tonight in Jesus' name. That everyone will be blessed and refreshed. And that every family will have the touch of the Lord even tonight in Jesus' name. Amen. Where we are getting things wrong, put us right. So that our lives and families will be light to the people, the neighbors around us. Thank you, Lord, for the answer. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you very much. You can sit down. Tonight we come to First Peter chapter 3. In 1 Peter chapter 3, we're reading verses 1 and 2. 1 Peter chapter 3, we're reading verses 1 and 2. Likewise, ye wives, be in subjection to your own husbands, that if any obey not the word, they also may without the word be won by the conversation of the wives. While they behold your chaste conversation coupled with fear. Those are the verses of scripture we're looking at today. You will see very clearly here the Lord is talking to us about the family. What does a family look like? In days gone by, we didn't need to define a family. And in some countries, we don't need to define a family. In many parts of the world, everybody knows a family is made up of the man and the woman, the husband and the wife, both joined together by the will of God, by the word of God. And then they live together until death do them part. In this part of the world, we know that. But in some different parts of the world today, you have a man and a man coming together and they say they are getting married. That's an abnormality. That's not according to the word of God. And sometimes you find a woman and a woman coming together and then they say they are married. In some cultures today, they are accepting that. But as contrary to the word of God, the husband is the man according to the word of God and the wife is a woman according to the word of God. And the man and the woman, the male and the female, joining together and remaining together until they, they, they do the death do them part that is the teaching of the word of god now as two people come together they need to live together and they need to be able to have fellowship together understanding together and lead their lives in such a way that both will be happy and both will have fulfillment in that marriage to start with you know that those people man and woman they are coming from different backgrounds and because they are coming from different backgrounds, they may have different understanding, different worldview, different perspective. Oh yes, they might even be Christians. That is, they both love the Lord and know the Lord and know the standard of the word of God. But all the same, they might still have different levels of understanding and different perspectives in life. And because of the different perspectives they have, they'll sometimes talk differently, think differently, plan differently, and yet they need to align everything together and be in agreement together in fellowship and in love. 
But there are some other cases that we have, like this in chapter 3, verse 1. Likewise, ye wives, be in subjection to your own husbands, that if any obey not the word. It's taking the wife here as a believer, as a child of God, as somebody that has the grace of God in her life. And it's taking the husband, and sometimes it happens like that, the husband as an unbeliever, that if any, that means if any of those husbands, any of the men, if they obey not the word, they have not heard the word, or they have heard the word, and they are not obeying. They do not have the salvation of the Lord. They do not have the grace of God in their lives. Therefore, they are not obedient to the word. And yet, here is the Christian woman, the Christian wife, that wants to still fulfill her duty in the family. And she wants to be obedient to the Lord as a child of God. But the husband is causing some problem. Opposition. Persecution. Contradiction. And attacks against her faith. What is that woman to do? That's what we are learning today. It says, wives, be in subjection to your own husbands. That if any of those husbands, if your husband in particular, will be not the word, they also, that is, the husband not to be in the word of the Lord, may be won by the conversation of the wives. While they behold, while those unbelieving husbands behold and see, and they look at, and they can tell that your life is very different. What they behold? Your chaste conversation. That is your manner of life. That is your character. That is your conduct. That is your lifestyle as a new creature in Christ. Your conversation coupled with fear. That fear there is not slavish fear. That is reverence and honor for the husbands. Some Christian wives or husbands sometimes think that they are peculiar situations or they are peculiar problems in their families these problems often arise because one spouse is converted while the other is not it may be that it's the man that is born again and it's the wife that is not born again or it may be on the other hand it is the wife that is born again and the husband is not born again or it may be that they had married before they were converted, before one of them became converted. And because now one of them has become converted, there's a change of life. There's a profession now of faith in Christ. And because of that profession in Christ, that generates a problem for the husband who is not born again. And because of that problem, the wife now is thinking, what will I do? How will I live my life so that... On the one hand, I'll be obedient to the word of the Lord. On the other hand, I'll still keep a happy home, a happy family, and a biblical scriptural family as well. Sometimes, both of them have been born again. But it may be that the husband has backslidden, has gone away from the word of God, might still be coming to church. But has drifted away and has uh, kind of gone away from obedience to the word of God. And the wife is still holding on to the faith. Holding on to the word of God. And living by the standard of the word of God. And this husband, backsliding husband, although might still be coming to church. Might even be still be reading the Bible. But is no more obedient to the word of God. And the wife is wondering, what will I do? So that where I don't backslide just because my husband has backsliding. Or sometimes the husband has not only backsliding in heart, he has backsliding also physically and naturally. And has even left the church. And it's now he's posing a problem, a challenge to the, husband, to the wife that is living according to the word of God. What is the believing wife, the Christian wife, the gracious wife, the one that is still standing according to the word of God? What are you to do in such a situation? Let me tell you what some people do. Some people have a kind of a three, a three part, a, a kind of principle, force, fight, and fret. That is, number one, the false issues. And they say, yes, I'm born again, but I'm not going to take any nonsense from you. And we're going to fight it out. My dear sister, if you do that, number one, you'll become a backslider like your husband. Force will not win the day. 
and force will not win the game. If you're going to win your husband to the Lord, that's what the Lord is telling us here. Number one, it's not by force. Number two, it's not by fighting. You see, there are women that will feel that, well, if I just submit to this man and I keep on just saying yes, yes, I'm, I'm in submission, I'm going to suffer more. Because of that, they get you to fight him. That's not the good fight of faith. That's a bad fight. And the grace of God is not going to be available in that kind of fight. Other people just fret. They worry. They get anxious. They nag. They complain, they give excuses, and all the time, in fact, their wives, because of family problems, they are fretting so much, they have hypertension, they have high blood pressure. The Lord is telling us then, they, if you're going to solve the problem in the family, it is not by force, it is not by fight, and it is not by fretting. Now you will see, let's go back to those verses again. Verse 1, likewise ye wives, be in subjection to your husbands, that if any obey not the word, they also may be won, by, uh, may be won without the word by the conversation of the wives. Number 1, you see the precept. What's the precept? Be in subjection to your own husbands. Number two, the purpose. What's the purpose? Who are you in subjection to your own husbands? It says that they may be won without the word by the lifestyle, the character, the conduct, the behavior, the Christ likeness of the wife. If that is a precept, how do you do it? Let's say, for example, you're a Christian woman, are you a believing woman? And you have the grace of God in your life. And your husband happens to be an unbeliever. Or your husband happens to be a backslider. How do you win him to the Lord? Number one, we've learned, it's not by force. It is not by fighting. It is not by fretting. How? Number one, by faith. You present this husband before the Lord. And you're believing the Lord. That the Lord who has given you grace will give him grace as well. That the day will come, the time will come, the day of joy and the moment of joy in your life. When this man will realize the way he has been going and things will turn around and you are presenting before the Lord, believing the Lord, number one, by faith. Number two, forbearance. You know, between the time of his own believing act and the time he comes to believe on the Lord and become saved, you'll have to endure quite a lot of things. And when we talk about endurance, endurance without complaint, endurance without compromise, endurance without worry and anxiety, endurance, you carry your cross with a smile, and the joy of the Lord will be your strength. You will not be going about, you know, complaining and singing those old songs. I'm not alone, I'm not alone. When you're really feeling alone. Number two then, forbearance. Number three, forgiveness. Whatever the man does, you even forgive before he does it. You know that he's not born again. And you understand that because he's not born again, I know the way he's going to act. Already, you believe, if you're living with a man for three years, for seven years, for 10 years, for 20 years, you can predict the action of the man. Anytime this happens, this is likely to be his reaction. And therefore, you make up your mind. Whatever he says and whatever he does, there's only one thing I'm going to do. I'm going to forgive. Number three, forgiveness. Number, number four, faithfulness. You will not say, huh, I know what the man is doing secret. I know that he's fooling around. I know that he's unfaithful to me. And because he's unfaithful to me, I am going to show him something. Don't show him anything. You just be faithful. You have your soul to keep. You have your salvation to guard. And you have a heaven to gain. Don't, because of the unfaithfulness of mortal man that's called an husband, don't because of that lose your soul. Faithfulness. Number five, freedom. You yourself, you must be free from the things that he is doing. That you are saying, well, this is not right. This is the mark of being a non-believer. This is the mark of being worldly. 
This is the mark of being carnal. This is the mark that my husband does not know the Lord. My husband is not following after the Lord. You yourself must not be guilty of the same thing that that sinner, that unbeliever, that, uh, that backslider is guilty of. Number five, freedom. Number six, fellowship. Don't turn, don't turn your face towards the wall. Fellowship. Turn your face towards one another. With all that he is doing. And with all, all that he refuses to do. Your husband is still your husband. And therefore, you'll fellowship together in conversation. You'll fellowship together in decision making. You'll fellowship together in just being happy together. Even though he is an unbeliever, he is your husband. Number seven, the fruit, the fruit of the spirit. The love and the joy and the peace and the long suffering and the gentleness and the goodness who are doing him good all the days of his life and the meekness, the humility, the faithfulness, the fidelity, and then the temperance, the self control, and how, how necessary it is sometimes. For the wife to be able to control herself when the man is, you know, sometimes he may even be drunk. Sometimes he's not drunk, but he's intoxicated by a particular philosophy and is hurting you. And that is the time you need the fruit of the spirit, which is temperance or self-control. You see, if we do all that, we'll be able to, number one, keep a happy home. And the man will not be a son in your flesh. you just live a happy life and the joy of the Lord will be your strength. But now let's go into details. We're going to divide the study tonight to three parts. Number one, the character of an unbelieving husband. The character of an unbelieving husband. Number two, the conduct of a submissive Christian wife. The conduct, the behavior, and the manner of life of a submissive Christian wife. Number three, the conversion of the husband through the wife. What a glorious day that will be when your life has such a great impact on your husband that now he comes to know the Lord and then he has real Christian experience with the Lord. We're starting from point number one, the character of an unbelieving husband. And let's look at uh, chapter 3 verse 1. Likewise, ye wives, be in subjection to your own husbands and then the next phrase describes those husbands that if any obey not the word if any obey not the word if any of those husbands obey not the word when you find that in the scripture if any obey not the word who are those people be referred to that they obey not the word one, that the defiant men, those who defy the commandments of God, and they defy the commandments of God, they defy the plan of salvation. They say, I don't want to hear anything about that. They are defiant. Two, they are the people who are disobedient. They obey not the word. They disobey the word of God flagrantly, openly deliberately and they say not for that and whatever you want to do woman do that's what they'll say they defy the word of god they defy the plan of salvation and they disobey the word of god if any obey not the word these are the deluded men they deceive themselves sometimes you know as your husband they will tell you uh, you think i'm not going to heaven I will tell you, I'm going to get to that heaven before you. And you know for a shorty that this man is not obeying the word. And then he said, don't preach anything to me. I know that already myself. Because, uh, you know, you think that I'm not, I'm not living right. I am telling you that heaven, I'll get there before you. They delude themselves. When it says they obey not the word. And let me just show you. It says in Romans chapter 10. Romans chapter 10. I'm reading from verse 16. Romans chapter 10 verse 16. But they have not all obeyed. They have not all obeyed the gospel. Those are the people. They have not obeyed the gospel. 
the gospel that shows us and gives us the plan of salvation they have not obeyed the gospel in that verse 16 it says for Isaiah said Lord who has believed our report they do not believe the proclamation of the gospel. They do not accept the Savior who is at the very center of the gospel. But look at verse 18. But I say, have they not heard? Yes, verily, their sound went into all the earth. And their words unto the ends of the world. These are people, when it says, they obey not the word. They are the people that have had the gospel. They've had it over and over and over again. And yet, they do not obey that word. In 1 Samuel chapter 15, we're tracing, uh, you know, these people, these men, these husbands, we're tracing their lives when it says, they have not obeyed. That if any obey not the word, they might be one. By the conversation, by the character of their wives. When they behold your chaste character coupled with fear. In 1 Samuel chapter 15 verse 19. Wherefore then didst thou not obey the voice of the Lord? Here was Samuel talking to Saul. You know some husbands are like Saul. They know the commandments of the Lord. They know the word of the Lord. They know the standard, the teaching of the word of God. But they're like Saul. They will not obey the word of God. And if you have such an husband, that's an unbelieving husband. That's a backsliding husband. He knows the word. He knows the standard. It's very, very clear to him. But he doesn't pray to have the grace and the faith and the strength and the power to be obedient to the word of God. But I told you that there are defiant people, disobedient people, deluded people. Look at the language of Saul in verse 13. In verse 13, and Samuel came to Saul. And Saul said unto him, Blessed be thou of the Lord. I have performed the commandment of the Lord. There are deluded people like, like, like Saul. While the Lord is mourning or concerning them, while the Lord is telling Samuel about them, that they Saul has gone away from the will of the Lord, from the word and from the way of the Lord. They are busy making testimony, empty testimony, worthless testimony. A baseless testimony. And you see what Saul said. I have obeyed the word of the Lord. The deluded people. And then the way you wife. You might think I will preach unto him. I will point it out to him. This is not right in your life. This is not right in your life. My dear sister it will not work. Generally husbands don't listen to the preaching. And the prophecy and the pastoring of their wives. And therefore, that will not be the method. That's why it says, this is the way you are to do it. It's by your character. It's by your meekness. It's by your humility. It's by your life in the Lord. When you are a new creature in Christ, and she is able to behold that every time. And he knows that this must be the grace of God in the life of this woman. That is what will break that woman down, that man down. Eventually, look at verse 20. Concerning this man, and Saul said unto Samuel, Yea, I have obeyed the voice of the Lord, and I have gone, and I have and I've gone the way which the Lord sent me. Uh, there are husbands that are argumentative. You know, if the wife will challenge the husband and say, my husband, oh, we're going to the same church together. We're hearing the same word of God together. How many messages have we had on marriage? And he says, what do you mean? I mean that, you know, we should obey this word. What's the implication of that? Are you telling me I'm not obeying that word of God? Well, my husband, between you and I, look at this, look at this, look at this. And the man will say, but no, that's your view about it. That's your understanding. That's your opinion. I have obeyed the word of the Lord. I have no condemnation in my heart. That's all. You see, you might be living with such a man, such a hard-hearted man, such a deaf man that is deaf. To the voice of the spirit of god 
How are you going to do? Not by force, not by fighting, not by fretting. There is a way that you'll be able to get that husband and bring him right to the foot of Calvary. He tells us eventually in verse 24, And Saul said unto Samuel, I have sinned. Saul said unto Samuel, I have sinned. You know, sometimes after a lot of argument, after a lot of, a lot of discussion, all right, all right, if you say that is sin, I have sinned. I would, I would seek the Lord. But you know, it's not by argument you are going to bring them to the Lord. In Jeremiah chapter 42, we're looking at those that obey not the word. Jeremiah chapter 42, I'm reading from verse 13. But if you say, we will not dwell in this land, neither will be the voice of the Lord your God, saying, no. You see, these are, when it says, if any, obey not the word, all these scriptures are clearing it for us. The husbands, the men, maybe the women too, that obey not the word of God. They are the people that say no to the very clear teaching of the word of God. They just say, no, that's not for me. No, I'm not ready for that now. No, I'm not going in that direction. No, I'm not going to obey that. But we had when the, uh, when the minister of God read to us from the word of God, please uh, hold that yourself. No, I'm not for that now. Those are the people defiant to the word of God, disobedient to the word of God, and deluded, self-deluded. That means they deceive themselves, saying, no, but we will go down into the land of Egypt, where we shall see no war, nor hear the sound of the trumpet, nor have hunger of bread, and there will we dwell. And now therefore hear the word of the Lord, ye remnant of Judah. Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, if ye wholly set your faces to enter into Egypt and go to sojourn there, then it shall come to pass that the sword which ye feared shall overtake you there in the land of Egypt. And the famine whereof ye were afraid shall follow close after you there in Egypt, and there shall ye die. And there are people that know that we shouldn't uh, be unequally yoked together with unbelievers and all the same. This is exactly what those men who are disobedient to the word of God, who are defiant at the word of God, who are deluded by their own self uh, kind of uh, uh, argument. And uh, that's exactly what they will do. They will go against the word of God and go away from the word of God. In Romans chapter 2 verse 8. Romans chapter 2, verse 8. If any obey not the word. And let's see who these people are as we read further. Romans chapter 2, verse 8. In Romans chapter 2, verse 8. But unto them that are contentious and do not obey the truth. They are contentious. Very much argumentative. And you know when you are talking to your husband and everything degenerates into argument, you must have the grace of God to stop the discussion right at that point. Once argument begins, once temper begins to rise, and once, you know, the facial appearance is changing, and once uh, the fellow is saying, well, mind yourself, don't let me... Uh, go beyond uh, this because uh, now if I beat you, you'll be, you know, reporting everywhere, going to ask fellowship, saying that this happening, that's happening. Therefore, let's stop it here right now. Better to stop it right there because the man is telling you that it's not going to have the gentleness of a child of God. And when those cases occur, then you understand this is not a physical fight. It is not something you can solve by psychology, by philosophy, or by human physical things. You'll go on your knees and present the husband unto the Lord so that the husband will really know the Lord. These people that are contentious and they do not obey the truth of the word of God, they've lost the grace of God. That's why the Bible says, ye wives, you be in subjection to the husband. Don't argue. Don't don't fight, don't force, don't fret, and just be in subjection. That if any obey not the word, if anyone is contentious, 
If anyone is disobedient to the truth or defiant to the truth of the word of God or is self-deluded, you, by your good conversation, by your Christian life, and by your Christian comportment, you'll be able to win them to the Lord. Your life will be a conviction upon them. And we're looking at Galatians chapter 5. If any obey not the word, Galatians chapter 5, verse 7. Ye did run well. Who did hinder you that ye should not obey the truth? Ye did run well. What the apostle here is saying is that there are some people who are even born again before. And at that time, they were running well. They were acting well. They were behaving well. They were talking well. And they were relating well with their wives. But then it says now, who did bewitch you? Who did hinder you? That you should not obey the truth. You see, there are some people, they deviate. They get diverted. And they're derailed away from the path of truth. And they're no more obedient to the truth of the word of God. When you see that, the moment a Christian wife sees that, it shocks you. This is not like my husband. My husband used to be very prayerful. And then self-controlled. And then very caring and very loving. And then was every time we said, let's go back to the Bible. When we first got married. But things have changed now. That my husband does not consider the standard of the word of God anymore. He did run well. But who has hindered him now? What has hindered him now that he will not obey the truth? That's what the Bible is saying. And when you see a situation like that, that's not the time to go to the aspiration and be, and be talking about your husband. If he overhears that you are talking about him, that's not going to change the man. And that's not the time to go about, go here and go there and say, pray for me. Pray my, for my husband. My husband is going astray. My husband is, my husband is doing that. That's not going to change the man. It's going to harden the man. The Lord has shown, he has given us exactly what to do. When you see that your husband, who was running well before and doing well before and acting well before, is not going the wrong direction, the Lord has shown us exactly what to do so that those men will be won back to the Lord. And I pray they will be won in Jesus name in first peter chapter 4 i'm reading from verse 17 first peter chapter 4 reading from verse 17 for the time is come that judgment must begin at the house of god and if it first begin at us what shall the end of them be that obey not the gospel of god those are the people it says they obey not the gospel they obey not the word they obey not the word now, what are you to do? It tells us exactly what you are to do. But let's come back to 1 Peter chapter 3. 1 Peter chapter 3. I'm reading from verse 1 again. Likewise, ye wives, be in subjection to your own husbands, that if any obey not the word, if any obey not the word, they may be one without the word by the conversation of their wives that word conversation means by the character by the lifestyle by the behavior by the christian living by the fruit of the spirit by the christ likeness of their wives now you see what the lord is telling us about the unbeliever the unbeliever is one that is not actually uh, believing the word of God and living by the word of God. And uh, dear sisters, Christian women, uh, your case is not peculiar. We found cases like that in the scriptures before. Let me just show you a few. In 1 Samuel chapter 25, 1 Samuel chapter 25, I'm reading from verse 17. In 1 Samuel chapter 25, verse 17, now therefore, no, and consider what thou wilt do. For evil is determined against our master and against all his household. For he is such a son of Belial that a man cannot speak to him. They're talking of Nabal. And Nabal had a wife, a good wife for that matter. A gentle, meek, humble wife for that matter. A sensible, reasonable wife for that matter. A well-behaved wife for that matter. But the man himself, here we are told in verse 17, is such a son of Belial that a man cannot speak to him. And the wife knew that. 
And the wife knew that it is not by trying to argue with neighbor that you'll win him over. You cannot win such people over by argument. Look at verse 36. In verse 36, and Abigail, that's the name of the wife of Nabal, came to Nabal, and behold, he held a feast in his house, like the feast of a king. And Nabal's heart was merry within him, for he was very drunken, wherefore she told him nothing, less or more, until the morning light. You see, Nabal had offended David, had spoken something that David would have even, David even threatened. He was going to kill him. He was going to kill the people related to Nabal. And then Abigail just knew, this is not the time to talk. This is not the, uh, you, you must not talk to the wrong person at the wrong time. And she knew that this is the time to appease David. And then she got food. She got everything she needed to get. And then went to David and said, please, all that thing, just put it on me. Because of the offense of my husband. And settled everything. By the time Abigail came back home, the man was drawn. And the wife knew this is not the time to talk. If you were a Christian wife, deeper life, a wife, what will you do? Number one, the man is even drinking. Number two, the man has done something wrong that he just saved his life and the family. And the fellow does not even realize what has happened at all. He's such a hard-hearted unbeliever, hard-hearted backslider, hard-hearted man, hard-hearted husband. He doesn't have any feeling of the bad thing, the evil thing that he has done. But we're told that Abigail said nothing about it. Can we have that kind of self-control? Can we have that kind of power, authority over ourselves to say nothing at that critical moment? That's exactly what we're learning from Abigail. And that's what we're learning from the passage we're studying today. There are times, many times, it's wisdom and it is grace and strength of character just to be very, very quiet and say nothing. In verse 37, it says, but it came to pass in the morning when the wine was gone out of Nabal. The, the woman knew when to talk. And so that's what you must learn. You must study. Study your husband. Study the man. Understand the man. And know exactly when to talk and when not to talk. When the wine was gone out of Nabal. That, and his wife had told him these things that his heart died within him and he became as a stone he became convicted of what he had done because the woman spoke at the right time we're looking at first samuel chapter 1 verse 2 first samuel chapter 1 and i'm reading there from verse 2 in first samuel chapter 1 verse 2 and he had two wives the name of the one was Anna, and the name of the other Penina. And Penina had children, but Anna had no children. You understand such a situation? Anna was the right wife, the first wife. And the man had gone to marry a second wife. And Anna didn't have any child, the right wife didn't have any child. And the second one, the second one, the stranger in the home, had children. And this man went up out of his city yearly to worship and to sacrifice unto the Lord, unto the Lord of hosts in Shiloh. And the two sons of Eli, Ophna, and Phinehas, the priests of the Lord, were there when the time was, was, and when the time was that Elkanah offered, he gave Penina his wife, and to all her sons and daughters portions, but unto Anna he gave a worthy portion. For he loved Anna, but the Lord had shut up her womb, and her adversary also provoked her soul. For to make her fret. That's the word. To make her fret. It's not only the man sometimes. It's the junior brothers and junior sisters. It's the relatives. And all the other people associated and related to the man. That make that may make your life difficult. To make her fret. Because the Lord had shut up her womb. 
And as he did so year by year, when she went up to the house of the Lord, so she provoked her. Therefore she wept, and she did not eat. But no angry words, no fighting, no force, no fretting. But she just prayed. And then we're told in verse 9, So Anna rose up after they had eaten in Shiloh, and after they had drunk. Now Eli the priest sat upon his seat by a post of the temple of the Lord. And she was in bitterness of soul and prayed unto the Lord and wept so. That's the attitude the Christian wife ought to have. That you will put your case in the hands of the Lord. And when you put your case in the hand of the Lord, just keep on living your life. And depending upon the promises of God, trusting in the Lord, that the Lord will do what he has promised to do. He will answer your prayer. We come back to 1 Peter now, chapter 3, verses 1 and 2. We come to point number 2, the conduct of a submissive Christian wife. The conduct of a submissive Christian wife. In 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 1 and 2. Likewise, ye wives, be in subjection to your own husbands. Be in subjection to your own husbands. And the implication of this is, you know, when a woman is having difficulty at home, uh, generally your mind may go to, may be diverted to men outside. Because you see, there are nice, nice men in your office. And then if you are not careful, the temptation will be, I wish this man, the director, were my husband. This man is so nice. This man is so gentle. If I compare him with my, uh, you know, rascal at home, with my naughty man at home, if I compare him with that wicked man at home, this man is preferable. That's why the Bible is saying, even though your husband is not obeying the word of God, and you find another man that looks gentle and nice and caring and generous in the office, don't shift your attention on the man in the office, that you'll be in subjection to your own husband's. And you know, sometimes as we come to the church, and uh, you know, we in this church we have great privilege. Our women have a much a chance over here. You can sing in the choir, you can lead in the house fellowship, you can lead in the district, and you can lead in the zone. And you have a lot that can get you occupied. And you know, the temptation for a Christian wife that's having a hell of problem at home. The temptation is, you know, the coordinator of the church is very nice. The coordinator is very understanding. And the coordinator is very gentle. And the coordinator is attentive. And the coordinator will listen to your story, you know, for hours. This man is a wonderful man. Why did I hurry to, uh, to marry my husband? This coordinator would have been a good husband for me. That's a great temptation. Sometimes the pastor of a local church uh, will be, you know, by the training of pastors, uh, those uh, pastors who are well trained and those who are looking at the Bible, we're supposed to be gentle, we're supposed to be caring, we're supposed to be counseling, we're supposed to care for, uh, for the problems of the church, of the members of the church. And especially, you see these uh, Christian women that are having fire burning in their family, they always run to the local pastor of the church. And the local pastor is going to give all the time, all their attention and it's going to keep on nodding it said yes you have a good case why is your husband doing like that and you say this man this pastor is understanding why is it you know if i could have married the pastor or another person like the pastor it would have been better for me the temptation is there that's why the word of god is saying don't yield to that temptation that you are you are going away from home and you are getting attached you might not even commit any sin. The man might not touch you. You might not touch the man. But in your heart, there's a drawing. There's an affection. There is an attachment onto another man outside because of the problem you have at home. That's why you see the word own. Over there it says, ye wise be in subjection to your own husbands. Don't run away from your husband. Don't get detached from your husband. And don't have a negative feeling, negative attitude to your husband. Don't be divorced in principle, although you are not divorced in the physical. Don't be divorced, don't be separated from your husband. Even though the difficulty is there, that's why it takes grace. That's why it says, your wives be in subjection to your own husband. 
And you know, sometimes uh, when you come to, it might be you come to the prayer meeting. And then in that prayer, it might be night vigil, might be prayer warriors just praying. And here comes a man, and then this man leads the prayer. And you say, what, what a man this is. This man can pray. And he prays like this and prays like that. And then you are challenged, you are charged up. It's like, you know, the prayer should not stop. And then you go back home, and then at the time you have to pray, your husband is sleeping. And then you say, I think I better go back to the night vigil. Because you know, it's much, much better than night BJ because that man, and if you're not careful, you'll be detached from your husband and your mind and your attention, your affection will be upon that prayer warrior, will be upon that person that knows how to pray very well. Be very careful. That's why it says, mark out your own husband. This is a special man in your life. Maybe he is, he is a soul of Tarsus today. He'll be the Paul, the apostle tomorrow. If you will just stay on your husband and stay with your husband and don't allow your mind to be diverted from your husband, be in subjection to your own husbands. That if any obey not the word, they also may be won by the, by the, may be won without the word by the conversation of their wives. Then it says in verse 2, while they behold, you may not know that those husbands are watching you. They are watching you. And when they do bad, they know. When, for example, you finish at the end of the month, and then the man, he is on his salary. You are on his salary, and then you bring the money. You say, well, this is the money. He's watching you, and then he say, okay, I will go and spend it. And you're expecting he would also say, this is my salary. To he never says that. He only thinks about himself. The temptation is to say, ah, you know how to save money. You know how to keep money, and everything is mine, is mine, is mine. It's my car, it's my land, it's my house, it's my certificate, it's my job. So I am the foolish woman that is bringing everything every time. All right, I know what to do. I don't know what to do. Just she is watching you, it's watching you. As the people of the world will say, You're foolish, they'll say, You're stupid. They'll say you don't have any sense. This man is keeping everything that he has. And you see how selfish the man is, how self-centered the man is. And every time at the end of the month, you're always coming saying, my honey, my dear, my husband, look at this. Why don't you stop that? That's what they will say. There are even some so-called Christian counselors that will tell you that, you know, stop that. Don't do that again. All these uh, joint account they are talking about, they are talking about good, good people. They are not talking about bad people like your husband. That's what they will tell you. But you know, it says be in subjection. What's money? Money is nothing. Lay the thing before the man. If he wants to chop everything, you know, just, just look at him and keep on smiling. And demonstrate the grace of God. You see, when you do that, God, God will defend you. The man might act as if he doesn't have any feeling. He might do that for some few months, but you keep on praying. Don't you know what the Bible says? That when your enemy hungers, you give him food. And when he starts to give him drink, because that is going to be a coal of fire upon his head. It will melt his heart one day. You think he will not change? He will change in Jesus' name. Amen. And so, don't use any kind of method they're using in the world and say, okay, I've been like this before, but now my husband has taught me a good lesson. And because of the attitude, behavior of my husband, I today say, so I'm going to do it. We don't do that. We don't do that. You are in subjection to your own husband that if any obey not the word, they may be one without the word by the conversation of their wives. While they behold your chaste conversation coupled with fear. Uh, that, that's what the Lord is telling us. The character of the woman, the character of the Christian wife will be so wonderful that eventually the man will be broken down. Titus chapter 2. In Titus chapter 2, we're looking at verse 4 and verse 5. Titus chapter 2 verse 4. That they may teach the young women to be sober and to love their husbands and to love their children now here christian uh, leaders uh, women leaders uh, pay attention you know it's uh, we think a uh, women ministry is very simple women ministry is tough and difficult uh, you know sometimes you're a christian women leader and uh, some of these women come to us and we women we were very sympathetic and you know we were very tender at heart and the woman comes and the woman is saying you know uh, counselor i'm really going through some tough times at home 
And then you as a women, Christian women leader, you say, oh, what, what's the problem? What are you going through? Oh, my husband is like this, like this, like this. Is that so? At that time, you might forget your ministry. You will teach that woman to love her husband. That's where grace comes in. It's difficult. But with grace, all things are possible. And that woman can still go back home and love her husband. Don't let us get into this worldly kind of psychology and worldly kind. You are not compatible anymore. If the man is acting like that, what are you looking at? Are you just saying yes, yes to the man? Are you just surrendering everything to the man? Are you not also keeping something behind for yourself? Why are you acting like that? That's why we have women ministry here. So that we women can teach you people how to tell them. If the man is tough, you too must be tough. Because if, that's what they tell you, some of them, if you are not tough like that, you know they are going to just trample on you. And you know, the, the men of nowadays, don't teach them like that. We women who are leaders in the church, it says you will teach them to love their husbands and to love their children. Now, weigh those two things together. Number one, to love their husbands. Number two, to love their children. We who are women leaders, how do you teach the mothers to love their children? My child is wayward. Do you tell them to? Well, if your child is like that, be tough with the child. You don't say that. My child is, you know, not always coming to sleep at home. You don't say, well, then lock the door against him. You don't say that. You teach them to love their children. And you tell them to still be gentle with those children. You be very careful, you tell them. Because if you're not very careful, if you're too hard on that child, that child may go away forever and then the child may do something that is even more serious than what you're seeing. Now be very careful, tender with that child. Why don't you change? If you have been saying, my child, don't do this, don't do this, don't do that, and, and the child is getting out of hand, you better change your method and be sought with the child. Isn't that what you tell the mothers when it says to love their children and to love their husbands? When the husbands are not doing well, that's the challenge. It comes to our women leaders to be able to tell, to be able to teach those women that, yes, understand what you are telling me. I can cry with you. I can weep with you. I sympathize with her situation. But you know, my dear sister, what the Bible says, be in subjection to your own husbands. That if any obey not the word, they, those disobedient, defiant, and deluded husbands may be won without the word by the conversation of their wives. When they behold your chaste conversation coupled with fear, that's what will teach them to love their husband, to, teach, uh, to love their children, to be discreet, chaste, keep us at home, good, obedient to their own husbands. Women leaders, here is a challenge. I'm saying women leaders because normally we men, generally, generally, we men will not want to teach a wife to be disobedient to uh, their husbands. You know why? Men, because what you sow, you will reap. If you teach a woman to be rebellious to her husband, you have a wife at home too. And your wife also will be rebellious to you. Therefore, what to teach other people, if you break other people's homes, your house will be broken. Therefore, we men are generally reasonable and careful. We say, that man is like that, all right? He's a man like myself. I'll call him. I'll talk to him. But you women, you cannot talk to the husbands. I hope you don't call the husband to lash them or to, you know, put pressure on them. You don't have any right to do that. We coordinators are there. Group coordinators are there. We pastors are there. Men will talk to the men. You talk to the women, but when you talk to the women, the conduct of the Christian wives at home, you tell them to be submissive to their own husband, to obey their own husbands, that the word of God be not blasphemed, that the word of God be honored. I pray that through us, the word of the Lord will be honored in Jesus' name. In Ephesians chapter 5, Ephesians chapter 5, I'm reading from verse 22, wives, Submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. As unto the Lord. Now, as unto the Lord qualifies it for us, we who are Christian uh, women, Christian sisters, because the Lord will not tell you to commit sin. 
The Lord will not tell you to do anything irrational, anything evil. You know, there are some men, I don't know how a man can do that, but there are some men, if they don't have any child yet, in their culture, they'll say, well, my wife, you see our situation now, I don't mind if you go out and bring pregnancy. Only don't tell me who is responsible for the pregnancy. There are some unreasonable men, irrational men, evil men that can say that. But you are a Christian wife. You cannot do that. You cannot say, yes, the Bible tells us be submissive to your own husband. It says, as unto the Lord. Which means then, if you know that your husband is commanding something, requesting something, demanding something, that God, that the Lord will not demand, then you cannot do that. You're only in subjection to your husband. is qualified as unto the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife. The husband is the head of the wife. Uh, do you remember what uh, we learned last week? Uh, you know, the head. Uh, you know, the head is there. How many of you have heads? Of course, of course. If you didn't show me, yeah, I'd be afraid of talking to someone. <laughs> Praise the Lord. But you know, the head is not so heavy. And the head wouldn't feel the weight. And you see, if you have a head in the family, you are not supposed to, you know, be so weighty and so, you know, so, uh, so difficult with your wife. We are the head, yes, but uh, the, the weight is not there. The pressure is not there. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in a everything so let the wives be in subjection to their own husbands in everything and you know sometimes uh, when you talk to any member of our church our church here we have the joy i don't want to use the word pride but almost like the pride like we obey the word of god we as we we obey the totality of the bible there's no church like our church you know some of us will say we just love the bible we study the bible we believe the bible and we believe everything we, we, we even some of us look down other churches and we say you know those other churches they don't have sound doctrine if you want the totality of the word of God come to deeper life we have the word but look at this verse 24 therefore as the church is subject unto Christ so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything if we knew this if we believe that there'll be no argument in our families and there'll be no pulling apart in our families you know, sometimes we have some families, even in this, our church, the wife is too strong and the husband is subservient. It's like, you know, the way they arrange it, that family, it's like the wife is totally in control. And when the wife does something, the husband cannot say, my wife, why are you doing that? Sometimes it even, it even happens to us who are pastors. And, you know, sometimes in our pastoral work in some regions and some states, we have reports coming. Oh, they say the pastor is very gentle, the pastor is very nice, and the pastor is very understanding. But the wife is fire, and the wife controls the church, and the wife disciplines the people. And the husband cannot talk because the husband is probably afraid of his wife. It should not happen like that. If we believe the Bible, the man is the head. And then the, husband, the wife will be subservient and submissive to that man. And if, you know, we women, we will thank the Lord for the privilege we have. It's a good privilege that we women were not, you know, thrown aside as to if, you know, you cannot take any part in the work of God. Yes, we can take part in the work of God. But the husband is the head of the home. And if your husband is an overseer, if your husband is a national overseer, region overseer, state overseer, if your husband is a pastor, the pastoral responsibility of that church is on the husband. And uh, we don't want to keep on hearing these kind of stories we are hearing. The man, the woman is tough, and the woman is difficult, and the woman is totally in control. And, you know, if you offend the wife, then you are gone away from that church. It should not be so. And you women, whatever knowledge we have, whatever understanding we have, let's still come under the authority of that, uh, of your husband, if your husband is in leadership. The same thing in, in our district churches, you know, the husband is a coordinator, and the wife might be a woman coordinator, 
I hope you are not taking loss into your hand and you are just, you know, boisterous and firm and difficult and tough and say, my husband is too gentle, my husband is too slow, I am going to handle this. Don't do that. You'll be in subjection to your own husbands. And now when it comes to the family matters, decision about where to live, decision about where to go decision about taking care of the children the decision we have in the you know in the in the family you know if you are taking decisions sometimes we have differences of ideas if uh, you know your husband is having say no we'll do it this way and then you are saying but it's better to do it this way what your husband is saying, once you know it is not sinful, it's not something that will land you into sin. It's just like you feel it's a, it's a worse decision. It's not as good as your decision. Submit. Just give it up. Why are we going to break the family? Because, you know, we're deciding whether to, you know, eat at 6 o'clock or eat at 8 o'clock. Tear the family because of that. Uh, you know, I heard of a particular family uh, because, you, you know, toothpaste? I said, you know, toothpaste? <laughs> I'm told that, you know, the, the husband will press it at the end, and then the wife will press it at the middle, and they started arguing. It's not good to press it in the middle. It's not good to, you know, it's, you know, it's better when, when I want it real full, I have to press it in the middle. The other fellow said, no, if, it will be rough. Like, if you press it at the end, then everything will still be neat. You know, we'll spend one hour arguing about such a thing give it up all those arguments i can give you assignment and you know where to read in the bible instead of arguing you know you just spend your time on useful things rather than arguing and arguing again if they are non-essentials give it up and just go your way and the lord will bless your families in jesus name Amen. now we come to point number three the conversation the conversion of the husband through the wife the conversion of the husband through the wife in first peter chapter three verses one and two first peter chapter three we're reading from verses one and two likewise she wise be in subjection to your own husbands that if any obey not the word they also may be may without the word be won by the conversation of the wives they may be won that is won to the lord drawn to the lord by the conversation by the lifestyle by the character by the christ likeness of the wives while they behold your chaste conversation coupled with fear they behold your chaste conversation coupled with fear and what the lord is telling us is that uh, let your character be so wonderful be so beautiful that uh, the man will be so much attracted to you by your character and attracted to your lord because of your wonderful character in matthew chapter 5 verse 16 matthew 5 verse 16 let your light so shine before men in this particular case now let your light so shine before your husband if you are saved, let that light of salvation beam forth before your husband. If you say you are sanctified, let that radiant life of the sanctified wife beam out, shine out before your husband. And if you say you are filled with the Holy Ghost and you have the fruit and also the power of the Spirit of God, let that power and that goodness of the Spirit shine out in your life. Let your life so shine before men that they may see your good works. That they may see your good works. My dear sister, uh, does your husband see that you are humble? You know, if you have to say, uh, you know, I'm humble, but my husband never sees it. Maybe the thing is so faint that, she, that he cannot see. I am submissive, but my husband is always complaining. I'm not submissive. Maybe it is so mild. That submission is not, is not witchy enough for your husband to see. Because to see if it's witty enough, it's clear enough, we will we'll see. And then your husband will be able to even talk to other men and say, you know, I thank God for my wife. She never argues with me. And then she might, he might even confess to other men and say, hey, you know, sometimes I even take some, you know, decisions that I regret later. I, I begin to tell myself, this is not right. And then I watch my wife. And my wife will never look at me as if I'm foolish. I see if I am, you know, a, a naughty fellow. My, my wife just respects me. And then I might even go to her later and say, my wife, you know, uh, that decision I took yesterday, I realized now it was wrong. And my wife will never make fun of me. Your husband will be able to say that outside. 
your husband will be able to say, I thank God for my wife. You know, she might, he might come home and say, you know, this church is too much, Bible study, Sunday worship, and, you know, Tuesday meeting, and Wednesday prayer meeting, and Thursday revival. This is too much. You must choose between church and husband. And then, and you say, my husband, why are you talking like this? And then you are gentle, and you are humble, and you are submissive, and you still come to church. And then you still do everything you ought to do at home, wash the clothes and clean the house and prepare the food and everything. That husband, although he might be, you know, telling you that, you know, you must cut down this sin, will be saying, you know, I thank God for my wife. Because my wife is, you know, although she has deeper life, but her own deeper life, I enjoy her. That's the good thing and that's the way it ought to be. Let your light so shine before your husband. That they may see your good works and glorify your Father, which is in heaven. If other people have done it, we can do it too. In First Peter chapter two, First Peter chapter two, we're reading from verse twelve. First Peter chapter two, verse twelve, having your conversation honest among the Gentiles. That whereas they speak against you as evil doers, they may by your good works, which they shall behold, glorify God in the day of visitation. Your lifestyle can be so wonderful and good that your husband will be drawn to the Lord and drawn to the church because of your lifestyle. But you know, my dear sister, it will not be right if your husband will say, well, you're inviting me to your church. You're saying your, you know, your pastor uh, preaches uh, the word of God. You're saying that, you know, your church stands on the Bible. I should come, I should come. You're not encouraging me. The way you are acting to me at home, how does that encourage me to go with you to your church? And the way you are, you know, acting, you, you go for Bible study, you spend uh, three hours, you tell me it's ghost load that delayed you that you had finished and okay. Now that you came back home, I can't see the mark of what you have learned. And then you are telling me, husband, come for Bible study, come from, for Bible study. When you act out that Bible study and I see the good of the Bible study, then I will follow you. But the way things are now, I'm not even happy with you. I'm just trying to tolerate and keep you in this family because, uh, you know, your trouble is too much for me. Now, if your husband is saying that, how are they going to come to the Lord? How will they join you in the church? And sometimes your husband is going to another church. It's not coming to deeper life. And then you're saying, well, pray for my family. My husband is going to this other church. They don't know the truth there. They don't preach sound doctrine there. My husband is, you know, I've been telling him, come to deeper life, come to deeper life. And the man will not come. Maybe he's not coming because of you. Maybe if you change, if you become humble and meek and submissive and loving and you're in good fellowship interaction together, maybe she will, he will listen to you. That's why the Lord is telling us, let our lifestyle, let our character actually draw these people unto the Lord. I pray they will come. In Zechariah chapter 8, Zechariah chapter 8, verses 22 and 23. Yea, many people and strong nations shall come to seek the Lord of hosts in Jerusalem and to pray before the Lord. Thus says the Lord of hosts, in those days it shall come to pass that ten men shall take hold out of all the languages of the nations even shall take hold of the skirt of him that seduced saying we will go with you for we have heard that god is with you i believe it will come to that time Amen. when all our brothers and all our sisters yes we do a lot of evangelism we do a lot of calling people to come to the lord but honestly, how many people have followed the Lord from the houses where we're living? From the communities where we're living? How many people have watched us so closely? And then they just come to you and they say, uh, Sir, if you're a man, next Sunday I want to follow you to church. Because I've seen the goodness of God in your life. How many of the people in our places of work, looking at how we do things, how we solve problems for people, how we're nice to people, how we show Christ-likeness in our lives. How many of them have said, which church do you go? I like to follow you to your church. I like to follow you to the place of fellowship. And then your husband, even without inviting your husband to church, maybe your husband is going to an Orthodox church. 
an historic church or is going to, you know, some of these other white garment churches and you never make any force at home, any trouble at home. And then because of your character, because of your lifestyle, because of your gentleness, because of your behavior, that your husband will say one day, I want to go with you next Sunday to your church and see what, uh, you know, you are tasting there because I, I appreciate the fact that this place you are going is benefiting your life. That's the way it ought to be and it will be like that. And that's the reason we need to pray and tell the Lord, oh Lord, we have heard your word. And we look at our families. We look at the different things happening in our families and we're saying, oh Lord, you will help us. You know, the word of God is so plain and so clear. And God has not given us any grievous commandment. There are things that are very simple to obey once we have the grace of God in our lives. And I pray that the grace of God will be multiplied in our lives in Jesus' name. Let's rise up. Don't accuse one another and don't blame one another let the husband pray and let the wife pray let everyone pray that the lord will help us that we will become better husbands and better wives and our homes will become heaven of rest beacon of light and then magnetizing drawing many people to come and know the lord uh, offer yourself before the lord and as you meditate upon the word of god you see areas where you've not done well as a christian husband Areas you have not acted well as a Christian wife. Areas you have not done well in relationship, in fellowship together, in a gentleness, in helping one another. Don't accuse one another. Uh, just correct your own part where, you know, the mistake has been on your part. And then let the wife uh, correct the mistake on her own part. Let's get back home and let's show forth the light of the gospel in our personal lives so that the Lord himself will make all the people to come to know the Lord through us. And if our husbands are unbelieving, that those husbands will come to know the Lord more. If our wives are unbelieving, that those wives will come to know the Lord more through our lives, through our Christian character, through our Christian conduct. You cannot force anybody into the kingdom of God. It's not by force. You cannot fight with somebody and then make him get saved. It's not by fighting. And fretting will not do it. By faith. We pray for our wives. We pray for our husbands. We pray for our loved ones. And we have faith. And then there will be forbearance. There are things to endure. There are things we just will not speak about. The husband is not going to appreciate it, pointing at his fault every day, crucifying him every time, complaining about him every time. Let there be forbearance in our family. The husband is unbelieving. Let there be forbearance. Let there be forgiveness too. Forgive him from the depths of your heart. Forgive and forget. Don't remind him. For how many years now you have been suffering in his house? Forgive and forget. It's our gracious life that will bring the man to the Lord. It's our good, godly life that will attract other people to know the Lord and be faithful. Don't say the man is unfaithful. He's unfaithful with the finance. You'll be faithful. He's unfaithful in relationships. He doesn't tell me everybody that he discusses with. You'll be faithful. Don't retaliate. He has friends I don't know. I must have friends he, he doesn't know. He goes to places he doesn't tell me. I must go to places I don't tell him. He spends his money in a way I don't understand. I will spend my money in a way he doesn't understand. You'll be faithful. Whatever is level of unfaithfulness, you'll be faithful. The Lord will be on your side. The Lord will support you. The Lord will use your Christian humble character to convert him, to change him. He'll become the best man in your life. 
and be free be free be free from the faults you're condemning your husband be free from the faults you're condemning your wife two wrongs will not make a right if he is not free you'll be free let there be fellowship manifest the fruits of the spirit let there be love don't wait until he shows love before you show love let there be love joy don't go about the home crying moody unhappy sour let the joy of the lord be your strength the fruit of the spirit is love and joy and peace if we're peaceful we're not quarrelsome we're not bringing up matters that always result in argument let there be patience long suffering don't pack your load and go stay that's the evidence of grace stay don't threaten if this happens again i'm leaving don't threaten let there be grace be nice and good nice to your husband nice to the in-laws let your mother-in-law take you as a real daughter let your father-in-law take you as a real daughter let the relatives of your husband desire to follow you to church because of the good relationship you have with them whatever negative thing happened in the past just tell the lord to forgive to forgive you to forgive your husband to forgive your wife and be willing from today to turn around let the grace of God become abundant in your life so there will be a change. God will help you. He has helped other people. He will help you. You need his help. He will help you. Salvation has evidence. This is the evidence of salvation. That although other people are bad to us,